let us get into my tips and tricks. Hi. Today's video is sponsored by me. No, seriously, Audrey and I have been working for the past couple months on bringing you an amazing deep dive ecology workshop. Basically, we are going to be turning insect and arthropod biology into a playable card game that we are going to mail to your house. How exciting is that? I'm so stoked for it. Chemtails, which is the name of our interactive mission, is all about arthropods, their toxins, their chemicals, their venoms, and their poisons, and how they are using those in their everyday lives. So if that sounds interesting to you, you can check out the end of this video because I will be talking all about it. And if you want to sign up because that's good enough for you, then the sign up link is right in the reference section. Now on to the video. This week is all about grad school and programs. <laughs> Hello, all of my beautiful, creative, intelligent, and curious love bugs. Welcome back to another video by me, Nancy from Cybugs. I'm an entomologist and today this is going to be part two of a three-part series. Last week is all about how to start to become an entomologist. This week is all about grad school and programs and next week is all about jobs in entomology. I have all of your questions here on my computer so I'm going to read them right now. Kylie says, things you wish you knew before getting into entomology, and I lumped this question into the grad school thing because basically I wish I knew a lot about picking grad schools so I could have had a better experience. Jason says, tips for applying to grad school or finding a program. And Lydia says, hello, my name is Lydia and I'm a senior environmental major and I am currently looking into entomology grad school and I didn't know if you had any tips and tricks to looking for schools or even questions to ask the schools when I go to visit. I appreciate any advice you could give me. I love your Twitter account and I'm a huge fan. Oh, thank you so much. This is why I really like these kind of like personal videos where I answer your questions. I feel like it really allows me to connect with you guys and I really like that. I was going to tell you my long saga about grad school but the turn as it turns out it's long and maybe i'll do a whole video on the whole thing someday i don't know let me know if you want that in the thought box i will also have a pdf in the reference section below that has a lot of these things outlined so don't take notes they're already there you know just sit back listen Ugh. the first thing i did wrong was only apply to three schools and i only got into the university of georgia which is why i went there what i should have done is realize that entomology is yes the study of insects but you can study insects in many different contexts you can study insects from a physiological perspective how is the insect working on the inside? From a genetics perspective, you know, what are some important genes? Do you know you can give fruit flies diabetes and they can suffer from alcoholism? Yeah, all that stuff was done on fruit flies in like genetic and medical labs and not specifically in entomology labs. And with that, we have some advice from Damien. And he says, this is such an interesting topic. I think it would be great if you highlight the fact that studying entomology can take so many different pathways and we should not try to fit into one traditional box. I did my bachelor in entomology, my master's in zoology, and my PhD in forestry. It's cool that these things related to bugs don't need to be entomology only, and that is the beauty of it. So many ecologists, people who work in management, among others, are entomologists, but don't fit the traditional conception. But not only don't limit yourself to just entomology programs, as you can tell, there's a lot of different programs that you can go into, forestry, ag, medicine, veterinary, ecology, forestry, physics, genetics, molecular biology, the, the evolution and development. Think about like the project that you would like to do on your insects. So like for me, I should have been looking in ecology labs and not necessarily strictly entomology labs. Think of a project that you'd like to do on a bug or a group of bugs that you'd be interested in and then find someone who's working on those things. And that brings me to tip number two. I'm so fired up, can you tell? Find a person, not a school, not a program, not a lab, because that person 
who is going to be your advisor and your mentor is going to basically be like a parent to you for the next four to five years, depending on how long you are going to be doing your program. This person is going to be helping you when you're struggling with your research, is going to be celebrating with you when you get your research published, is going to be helping you pick projects and programs that are related to your end goals. Read their papers. I again entered graduate school under the thought that I would be doing ecology and field work because when I had skimmed through my first advisor's papers, at the end there was always a little component, but this needs to be tested in the field. And I was like, who better to test this in the field but me? But if I had really taken the time to read his papers and read the methodologies, I would have realized that I was walking directly into a molecular biology lab and that probably wouldn't have been a good fit for me. You should look at what the current students are working on. Most students are very excited about talking about their projects. If they are not excited about talking about their projects, that is a warning sign because that might mean that that lab is focused more on competition than collaboration. Science in some ways can be a little bit toxic, just like publish, 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 keep your ideas to yourself, someone else is gonna steal them, someone else is going to publish them first. But for me, particularly, like I think collaboration is a much better environment to be in. If all the students are collaborating and helping each other with their papers, that's better for the entire lab because everyone gets put on everyone else's papers. It's good for everyone in that lab because their CV or the resume is really bolstered up with all the work that they've been helping on. Whereas all of the students are just working on their own project and that's it, then when you do your grad school career, you might come out with one or two papers and that's it. I have found that labs that focus on collaboration within their lab and with other labs and with other schools generally produce more well-rounded students that have more to put on their CVs than labs that just focus on, you focus on your project and you focus on your project and that's it. So how do you find this person? This would be tip number three. Define your goals and figure out what you want to get out of grad school. When I'm saying that I went to grad school too young, it wasn't necessarily the age. It was that I didn't know who I was as a person. I didn't know what was important to me. I didn't have a lot of job experience under my belt. And I just didn't have the life experience yet to have defined goals of what I wanted to get out of graduate school. I went into grad school because that was the next step. Finding someone who aligns with those goals is really important for you. You're going to want to ask very specific questions. There is a lot of pressure on professors to both be researchers and professors and teaching professionals. Questions like if you're focused on research, how often are you researching and publishing papers? What are the last journals that you have published in? How often do you expect your students to be researching? Do your students help with the grant writing process? If you are interested in teaching questions like, what is your teaching philosophy? How many classes do you teach? What are some assignments that you've given your students that you thought were particularly valuable? Asking your professor or your potential advisor how they help their students with professional development. Do you help them get different professional certificates? Do you help them get different professional awards? Do you let them go to networking events such as conferences and things like that? If social media presence is important to you, check their social media. Those are good questions to ask to see if your personal goals align with their goals. And finally, know who you are and know how you like to be managed. How does this person run their labs? How many meetings do they have? Are they willing to be more flexible based on the needs of individual students? I am definitely a person that needs to have solid deadlines and be harped on to get things done. Otherwise, I'm just like get distracted and like fall off the wayside or whatever. And so weekly meetings for me were definitely not enough. I definitely probably needed daily check-ins. Remember that you are picking them as much as they are picking you. I have a really good piece of advice by my friend Liz. I remember my master's took me four years and that is so long. I mean, I did change advisors halfway through and had to restart. So I basically did like two different masters, but I was so upset about it because it took me so long. And my friend Tiffany, who was going grad school, she came in and she graduated with her PhD in five. 
And I remember just being really upset about it. And my friend Liz, she had the best advice for me. She said, Nancy, I've seen this happen over and over and over again. People who end up in grad school when they're really young always take longer. You don't know who you are as a person. You don't know how you work well. You don't have your end goals in mind. All of these things. It always takes people who are younger longer. Whereas people who are more established in their 30s and are coming into grad school come in with a specific reason, with a specific end goal and are doing the work to get out because they know what their goals are. And she told me that that time is always spent somewhere. You either are spending that extra time in grad school when you're younger or you're spending that extra time if you went in when you were older getting job experience and figuring out who you are as a person. And so she basically eased my mind a little bit and I felt like this was just part of my journey and my journey took me a little bit longer than other people, but that's nothing to compare myself to. Can I help you? Well, you have to wait. Mm. Once you're already in grad school, there's a few things that you should keep in mind. Four, organization. This is keeping your goals in mind. Again, I love the bullet journaling system. There are links in the reference section about bullet journaling. Unfortunately, I didn't learn about bullet journaling until after I left grad school and it helps me run my own business now. However, I feel like bullet journaling would have helped me so much in graduate school. Find a system that works for you. Finally, on this note, keeping your end goals in mind will help you manage projects as they come your way. In grad school, people tend to just be like, here, take this, take this, take this. And while there are some projects that you will have no choice on that probably aren't particularly related to what you are going to be doing, the ones that you do have the choice on, you want to make sure that you're spending your time wisely and pick projects that are specifically going to help you in the future. Is there a research project that is really interesting that would help you develop skills that you need in the future for other kinds of research that you want to do? Is there a class that you can teach that really shows your creativity and gives you a lot of freedom? Is there a program that allows you to learn a new skill that would be helpful in either of those two scenarios? Whatever it is, make sure that what you're saying yes to in your very limited time is things that are going to help you at the end get to where you want to go. Five, your mental health. It is no secret that many students in graduate school are depressed. It is a hard time, I'm not going to lie. It's difficult, there's a lot of stress, things are fast paced, and a lot of things are expected out of you. So going in and knowing that that is a possibility will help you counter it. Again, staying organized, saying yes to projects, that you want to do and are important to you and picking the right people on your team is going to help significantly with those aspects. But also keep in mind to prioritize yourself, make time for yourself. There's so many times that professors and researchers have dedicated their lives to their research and don't understand how you as a 20 or 30 something year old person wouldn't also be dedicating all of your nights and weekends to the same endeavor. It's important for you to draw boundaries and lines and make sure that you are taking care of yourself, you're getting enough sleep, you're eating properly, and you're exercising. Find supportive people, find supportive friends, find supportive spaces that are not related to your work. Remember that we are people and not robots. There's nothing wrong with needing to go to therapy or counseling or just chatting to a friend. The healthier your mind is, the easier it will be to get through grad school. Finally, number six is to realize that you are never, ever, ever trapped. Any of the experience that you have done up to that point, you can put on resumes, you can put on CVs. You are allowed to leave at any point. And I want to stress this so much because I feel like so many people are like, oh, I put so much time into it, I have to keep going, et cetera, et cetera. I almost quit halfway through myself. And one of my mentors, one of my teaching mentors was like, you know, I've seen people come to this, this time in their life a lot. Some people quit, some people change labs, and some people are like, I'm really close, I'm just gonna like tough it out. What choice you make for you is completely personal, but there is no shame in changing labs, there is no shame in changing programs, and there is no shame in changing trajectories. You are in grad school to learn and gain specific skills for your outcome, and if what you are doing in grad school is not going to help you fill your end goals, there is no shame in leaving. So you can change advisors, you can change programs, you can change schools, and you can just leave. I decided after my master's that 
that was good enough. I did not want to get a PhD and that obviously academia was not the trajectory for me. I'm so very grateful for that experience. Even though my grad school experience was difficult, I did learn a lot of skills that did help me in the end. Did I efficiently use that time? Probably not as much as I could have, but hindsight is always 2020. Well, lovely love bugs, this is all I have for you. I hope that this was helpful. Let me know if there was anything that you thought of that you thought I should, should have covered in the comments. Please let me know. If there's something that you thought was particularly useful from this that you may want to make sure that other people definitely have heard of, and no, please leave that in the comments as well. And if you think this video could help you or friends or other people who are thinking about grad school, please also share this with them. Thanks so much, love bugs, for making it to the end of this video. And I'm so excited to talk to you a little bit more about what Chemtails is. Chemtails is an ecological and entomological interactive and gamified workshop focused on the chemicals of different arthropods and how that relates to their stories, their everyday lives, and their ecology. Now, I'm so excited, as I teased in the beginning, you will be getting a playable card game, and that card game is what you and the other participants, named bees, put together and create in that mission. You will get a physical card game mailed to your house, and it will come with not only a rule book, but also come with a full guidebook explaining and talking about the interesting bits of biology of all of the arthropods mentioned in those cards. So you'll have a physical representation of all the work and all the things that you learned. How this workshop runs is that it is set up into seven different video chapters. They are chapters like just like you'd find on YouTube of a deep dive of a particular subject. And then there are live question and answer sessions. And many of those question and answer sessions have guest experts. So not just me, but like when we do the spiders, we have a spider expert on. And when we talk about millipedes, we have like a millipede expert. I'm very excited. Our chapters that we're going to be covering is getting our bases down in the terminology. Then we're going to be going into a case study, looking at millipedes and centipedes. They look basically the same, but they couldn't be more different. Then we are going to be talking about the diversification of different venoms within arthropod lineages focusing on toxic and venomous spiders and even have an interview with one of my friends who got bitten by a black widow. Then we are going to move on to the convergence of different arthropod lineages converging and using the same chemical despite being distantly related and we are going to be using a case study of a beetle that blasts hot acid out of its butt like a machine gun. So excited about that. Then we're going to be talking about our heavy hitters, our tarantula hawk and our bullet ant. The tarantula hawk has been described as painful, like someone dropping a hairdryer into your bubble bath. So we're going to talk about that and why these insects need that venom to be so powerful. And then we are going to be moving on to the gift giving aspect because nothing says love like poisonous chemicals and really alkaloids are a girl's best friend. And then finally, we are going to move on and end with parasitoids, everything from zombies to mind control and a wasp that walks a cockroach like a dog to its own grave. So if those topics sound interesting to you and you want to have a playable card game focused on insect biology, you can find all the information that you need in the reference section. And I'm so excited and I hope to see you all in the mission with us. And with that, I will see all of you lovely love bugs on the YouTubes and also hopefully for the mission. I will see you all next week. Bye. If you want to see last week's video, it is there. And if you want to see next week's video, it will be here when that goes up. All right. Bye, everybody.